Priority Sector Lending We all know that the banks play a very crucial role in the process of economic development and growth and so the availability of banking infrastructure is considered as one of the prerequisites for rapid and balanced development of the country. In this lesson, we will explain the priority sector lending in India, discuss the self-help groups and micro, small and medium enterprises, know about the project financing and explain the export and import financing. After going through this presentation, you should be able to explain priority sector lending, describe the RBI guidelines for priority sector lendings, discuss self-help group, differentiate between micro, small and medium enterprise, analyze project financing, understand export finance and import financing. Commercial banks should increase the involvement in the financing of priority sectors like agriculture and small-scale industries. The description of the priority sectors was later formalized in 1972 on the basis of the report submitted by the informal study group on statistics relating to advances to the priority sectors constituted by the Reserve Bank in May 1971. The priority sector broadly comprises agriculture, small-scale industries, small road and water transport operators, small business and consumption loans. Microcredit provided by banks either directly or through any intermediary, loans to self-help groups, SAGs or non-governmental organizations, NGOs for on lending to SAGs. Direct finance to agriculture shall include short, medium and long-term loans given for agriculture and allied activities. Direct finance to small enterprises shall include all loans given to micro and small manufacturing enterprises engaged in manufacture or production processing or preservation of goods. Retail trade shall include retail traders or private retail traders dealing in essential commodities. Education loans include loans and advances granted to only individuals for educational purposes up to Rs 10 lakh for studies in India. Finance to agriculture sector. Direct agricultural advances denotes advances given by banks directly to farmers for agricultural purposes. These include short-term loans for raising crops, that is, for crop loans. In addition, advances up to Rs 5 lakh to farmers against pledge or hypothecation of agricultural produce, including warehouse receipts for a period not exceeding 12 months, where the farmers were given crop loans for raising the produce, provided the borrowers draw credit from one bank. The sub-target for direct agriculture advances is 13.5% of the NBC. Indirect finance denotes to finance provided by banks to farmers indirectly, that is, through other agencies. Sub-target for indirect agriculture advances is 4.5% of NBC. Indirect finance in the small and medium enterprise sector will include credit to agencies involved in assisting the decentralized sector in the supply of inputs and marketing of outputs of artisans, village and cottage industries, advances to handloom cooperatives, credit provided by banks to KVIC under the scheme for provision of credit to KVIC by consortium of banks for lending to viable Khadi and village industrial units, bank finance to HUDCO either as a line of credit or by way of investment in special bonds, issued by HUDCO for on lending to artisans, handloom weavers, etc. under tiny sector may be treated as indirect lending to SSI, tiny sector. Deposits placed with SIDBI by foreign banks in fulfillment of shortfall in attaining priority sector targets. Self-help groups refer to a homogeneous group of 10 to 20 members formed with intent to save a small amount regularly to help each other in times of need. 
homogeneous group imply common characteristics they share amongst themselves. Financing through SAGs reduces transaction cost for both lenders and borrowers. Pooled savings, one kept in savings bank account in the name of SAG. Only one person of a family can be the member of a SAG. The group formed by the members of heterogeneous background cannot depict a strong group dynamic, hence can't be sustainable. Group should be in existence for at least for a period of six months, should have undertaken savings and credits from its own resources and should be maintaining proper accounts or record, meeting registers, etc. An NGO which promoted SAG can approach the bank for advance for onward lending to SAG. Here, such should have good track record in existence for at least three years and having audited balance sheets. SAGs would not be in a position to offer any security other than the group savings. As such, the advance may be treated as clean or unsecured advance. The enterprises engaged in the manufacture or production of goods pertaining to any industry specified in the first schedule to the Industries Development and Regulation Act 1951. The manufacturing enterprise is defined in terms of investment in plant and machinery. The enterprises engaged in providing or rendering of services and are defined in terms of investment in equipment. A micro-enterprise is an enterprise where investment in plant and machinery, original cost excluding land and building, and the items does not exceed rupees 25 lakhs. A small enterprise is an enterprise where the investment in plant and machinery, original cost excluding land and building, is more than rupees 25 lakhs, but does not exceed rupees 5 crores. And a medium enterprise is an enterprise where the investment in plant and machinery, original cost excluding land and building, is more than rupees 5 crores but does not exceed rupees 10 crore. A micro enterprise is an enterprise where the investment in equipment does not exceed rupees 10 lakh. A small enterprise is an enterprise where the investment in equipment is more than rupees 10 lakh but does not exceed rupees 2 crores. A medium enterprise is an enterprise where the investment in equipment is more than rupees 2 crore but does not exceed rupees 5 crores. The micro and small enterprises, manufacturing and service will be classified under priority sector. Lending to medium enterprises will not be included under priority sector. The contribution of micro, small and medium enterprises, MSME sector to manufacturing output employment and exports of the country is quite significant. Some constraints that are faced by SMEs are accessing credit on easy terms has become difficult in the backdrop of current global financial crisis and the resultant liquidity constraints in the Indian financial sector which has held back the growth of SMEs and impeded overall growth and development. The financing constraints faced by Indian SMEs are attributable to a combination of factors that include policy, legal or regulatory framework in terms of recovery, bankruptcy and contract enforcement, institutional weaknesses, absence of good credit appraisal and risk management or monitoring tools, and lack of reliable credit information on SMEs and availability of finance at cheaper rates skills about decision making and good management and accounting practices and access to modern technology. Project financing is the financing of long-term infrastructure and or industrial projects using debt and equity. The first priority on project cash flows is given to the lender and the consent of the lender is required to disburse any surplus cash flows to project sponsors. The higher risk projects may require the surety or guarantee of the project sponsors. Project financing discipline includes understanding the rationale for project financing, how to prepare the financial plan, assess the risk, design the financing mix and raise the funds. Risk minimization process. The minimization of risk involves a three-step process. The first step requires the identification and analysis of all the risk that may bear upon the project. 
The second step is the allocation of those risks among the parties. The last step involves the creation of mechanisms to manage the risk. The financiers will carefully review the study and may engage independent expert consultants to supplement it. Commercial risks are sought to be allocated to the private sector and political risk to the state sector. Risk must be also managed in order to minimize the possibility of the risk event occurring and to minimize its consequences if it does occur. Risk management is facilitated by imposing reporting obligations on the borrower and controls over project accounts. Types of risk are classified on the basis of the design and construction phase, the operation phase or either phase. Construction phase risk, completion risk. Completion risk allocation is a vital part of the risk allocation of any project. This phase carries the greatest risk for the financier. Construction carries the danger that the project will not be completed on time, on budget or at all because of technical, labor and other construction difficulties. Completion risk is managed during the loan period by the method such as making pre-completion phase drawdown of further funds conditional on certificates being issued by independent experts to confirm that the construction is progressing as planned. Operation phase risk, resource or reserve risk. This is the risk that for a mining project, rail project, power station or toll road there are inadequate inputs that can be processed or serviced to produce an adequate return. Operating risk include, for example, the level of experience and resources of the operator, inefficiencies in operations or shortages in the supply of skilled labor. Market risk is the risk that a buyer cannot be found for the product at a price sufficient to provide adequate cash flow to service the debt. Participant or credit risk are the risk associated with the sponsors or the borrowers themselves. To minimize these risks, the financiers need to satisfy themselves that the participants in the project have the necessary human resources, experience in past projects of this nature and are financially strong. Technical risk is the risk of technical difficulties in the construction and operation of the project's plant and equipment including latent defects. Currency risk include the risk that depreciation in loan currencies may increase the cost of construction where significant construction items are sourced offshore. Regulatory or approval risk are risks that government licenses and approvals required to construct or operate the project will not be issued. Political risk is the danger of political or financial instability in the host country caused by events such as insurrections, strike, suspension of foreign exchange, creeping expropriation and outright nationalization. Force majeure risk is the risk of events which render the construction or operation of the project impossible, either temporarily, ex for example minor floods, or permanently. Our imports are more than exports, hence there is a necessity to encourage exports. Government and RBI extend various concessions to boost exports. Some of the concessions include It is cheap credit to exporters. Minimum of 12% of net credit should go to exports. Refinance to banks on eligible portion of export credit outstanding. ECGC guarantee for export credits. No margin requirements for advance against export receivables. It has flexible approach to export lending and norms of lending. Time norms for disposal of application for export credit. Rejection with the concurrence of next higher authority. Bifurcation of WC limits into loan and CC component after excluding export limits and issue of cold card to exporters with good track record. Export credit can be broadly classified into pre-shipment finance and post-shipment finance. Pre-shipment finance refers to finance extended to purchase, processing or packing of goods meant for exports. Financial assistance extended after the shipment of export falls within the scope of post-shipment finance.
Next, post-shipment. Loan or advance granted to an exporter from the time of shipment of goods to the time of realization, including against the security of duty drawback or any receivable from the government. Pre-shipment can be classified as packing credit facility and advance against checks or drafts. Packing credit facility can be provided to an exporter on production of the following evidences to the bank. Formal application for release the packing credit with undertaking to the effect that the exporter would ship the goods within stipulated due date and submit the relevant shipping documents to the banks within prescribed time limit and firm order or irrevocable L oblique C or original cable or fax or telex message exchanged between the exporter and the buyer. Pre-shipment credit is only issued to that exporter who has the export order in his own name. Next types of post-shipment are export bills. Non-LC bills is used in terms of sale contract or ordered, may be discounted or purchased by the banks. Export bills negotiated. Bills under L oblique C. The risk of payment is less under the LC as the issuing bank makes sure the payment. Advance against export bills sent on collection basis. Bills can only be sent on collection basis if the bills drawn under LC have some discrepancies. Sometimes exporter requests the bill to be sent on the collection basis, anticipating the strengthening of foreign currency. Advance against export on consignment basis. Banks may choose to finance when the goods are exported on consignment basis at the risk of the exporter for sale and eventual payment of sale proceeds to him by the consignee. Advance against undrawn balance. It is a very common practice in export to leave small part undrawn for payment after adjustment due to difference in rates, weight, quality, etc. Advanced against claims of duty drawback. Duty drawback is a type of discount given to the exporter in his own country. This discount is given only if the in-house cost of production is higher in relation to international price. Import financing is the issuing bank under a credit received a single correct trial after issuing the applicant in accordance with the signing of the import financing agreement and the issuing trust receipt submitted by the applicant first the external pay and put a single paragraph. Applicant and issuing vouchers for delivery in the market after the bill advance principal and interest will be returned to the issuing bank. In a sense, it is the issuing bank will be given to applicant into long-term credit at site letter of credit plus import financing such a flexible way of financial intermediation. For banks, both compared with the general working capital loans or long-term credit, compared with the equivalent of special loans and to bank charges have ownership of the goods imported negotiation. In fact, much more secure, revenue and better. Now let's see how much you have learned till now. State whether the following statements are true or false. Priority sector are financed from commercial banks. True. Microcredit shall include retail traders or private retail traders dealing in essential commodities. Fair price shops. False. Indirect finance denotes to finance provided by banks to farmers indirectly, that is, through other agencies. True. Before we end, let us briefly revise what we have studied so far. Direct finance to agriculture shall include short, medium and long-term loans given for agriculture and allied activities like dairy, fishery, piggery, poultry, beekeeping, etc. directly to individual farmers without limit for taking up agriculture or allied activities. The contribution of micro, small and medium enterprises MSME sector to manufacturing output, employment and exports of the country is quite significant.
Direct agricultural advances denotes advances given by banks directly to farmers for agricultural purposes. Self-help groups is a homogeneous group of 10 to 20 members formed with the intent to save a small amount regularly to help each other in times of need. Project financing is an innovative and timely financing technique that has been used on many high-profile corporate projects including Euro Disneyland and the Euro Tunnel. Export credit can be broadly classified into pre-shipment finance and post-shipment finance. Import financing is the issuing bank under a credit received a single correct trial after issuing the applicant in accordance with the signing of the import financing agreement and the issuing trust receipt submitted by the applicant.